So for our next speaker, we have Tom from Epic Solutions, who will be talking about how to design equitable filters in Julia. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Thanks for your attention. How do you design an equal ripple filter in Julia? I asked myself that question when I started looking into Julia earlier this year. I am a long time uh, MATLAB junkie in my past life. And after that, I switched to Python. The last 10 years or so, I've been using Python and NumPy and SciPy and C++ to do my work. I work in wireless communications and signal processing. And uh, I heard about this Julia thing. It's the hot new thing. It's exciting. Um, and it is exciting. I'm, it's really cool to be here and see um, how easy it is to do some things in Julia that are harder to do in other languages. Um, but I'm still learning. I'm kind of a newbie. So I thought it would be good to uh, see if anybody's using it for signal processing. So besides myself, anybody use Julia for digital signal processing? There's some hands. Nice, nice. Um, well, my talk is about a 45-year-old algorithm, one of the core pieces of uh, digital signal processing from the 70s. And um, the name of the function is called Remez. It is a function in SciPy's filter design package, and it did not exist in the DSP package. There is a DSP package, dsp.jl for Julia, and um, it has other great filter design stuff, but it was missing Remez. And I used to work at MathWorks in the 90s, and I worked on Remez at the time, um, and I use it to design filters. I would prefer it over the window method any day, um, and I'm gonna talk about that. And so I, as, as I wanted to learn about Julia, I thought it would be a good thing to implement. And um, it, it, I would have been done a lot sooner if it was as simple as just a C call into the SciPy version of, uh, that exists in C. Um, I got that done in you know, April or so, but then we wanted to make it a pure Julia library. So, well anyway, enough said for my intro. Now I'm going to start. A little bit of background on FIR filters. So um, the top is the time domain equation. We have a linear time invariant, invariant system, H, and the output samples, it's a discrete time sequence uh, defined on the integers n. Uh, the output sequence y of n is related to the input sequence x of n and the coefficients h through this well-known convolution equation. It's just a sliding inner product. And uh, in the frequency domain, this, that looks like this. We have a capital Y of omega, that's the frequency domain version, uh, which is the Fourier, discrete time Fourier transform of y of n which is um, just the product of h of omega times x of omega, the Fourier transform of h and x, respectively. So the question of designing a filter is, how do we get these coefficients, h0 through h l minus 1, l, l numbers, so the frequency response is good in some way? For example, we might, might want to design a low-pass filter. Um, that has a value of one for some frequencies below a certain cutoff frequency, Fc, and it's zero above that frequency. Um, this is an easy one. This is an integral I can solve, actually, because um, you can just put a one here. <laughs> and then it's just the e to the j n omega. Um, you end up with a couple of uh, e to the j omegas down here e to the j n omegas, and you can refactor it, and you end up with a sync function, the well-known sync function. Well, great, but it's infinite duration, so it's not a realizable filter. Um, okay, it might be too big. 
a uh, simple approach is just to take that sync function, which goes on for all infinity, and truncate it. So on, over here on the left, we have uh, a filter. This is a couple lines of Julia that um, defines a vector of n, a vector n that has uh, the integer values from minus seven to seven, so 15 values. So this is a length 15 filter, and this is its time domain, and this is its frequency domain. And I'm comparing the, um, the blue line, which is the ideal response, to the green line, which is what happens if we just truncate, and we're using the sink for the center uh, value. And this actually is not an unreasonable thing to do. Um, this is the solution to the least squares problem. If you integrate uh, in the frequency domain the error function, the, the squared error, this is the minimum solution. But the problem is it's got these ringings going on. It, it tends to overshoot. It's called Gibbs effect. Um, so what's done typically, and this is something that existed already at, um, for years in DSP.JL, is you apply a window. And uh, so this is how you design a window-based FIR filter in Julia. You, it, using DSP, you create a low-pass filter type with uh, your cutoff frequency. You define an FIR window <coughs> prototype. That, that's sort of like how they're... Um, that defines how, how to design the filter, and then you call digital filter, passing it those two things that you created. Um, so you can see, compared to the previous response, there was a little bit more energy uh, on the tails. So a window is just multiplying that thing, that impulse response, by something that tapers it at the edges. So it's big in the middle and then kind of smoothly varies it. And then that convolves in the frequency domain. It, 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 um, tends to dampen down those ringing effects. Um, it can make things better and it can make things worse in some ways. In this case, it made the stop band error better, but the pass band error is terrible and the transition width here is pretty terrible. Um, it's a heuristic technique. It's very cheap to implement, but we have computers and we have a better way. So this guy, in the 1970s, when I was about four years old, um, came up with an algorithm at Rice University. He was a master's student in Tom Park's um, uh, signal theory class. And they applied Chebyshev approximation theory to this problem. So um, I know Jim from back in the day at MathWorks. And this is a him. He's, I, I, this is a picture he sent me for this talk, um, with him posing with his Fortran card decks from the early '70s. So it's like you know this tall. Uh, it's like a seven or eight hundred line um, Fortran program that was completed in 1973. And uh, so thank you, Jim, for for sharing this photo. Chebyshev approximation, the goal is to minimize the maximum error. In order to do that for an FIR filter, you need to introduce a transition band because the maximum error, if you don't have a transition band, there's no way you can ever get better than a half for the error because the error, it's got to, it's got to smoothly vary across some transition band. So, there, so it introduces this area where there's a don't care region. There's an alternation theorem in Chebyshev approximation theory that applies here. It says that the filter is optimal if and only if the error alternates. That means it kind of goes above its maximum value, um, below, it goes above, below, above, below um, in, in an alternating fashion, um, taking on its maximum value at those points. And the, at, at, in, for at least m plus two points, where m is related to the filter length. I have one minute left. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, yeah, I can't finish this in one minute. 
So I'll, I'll leave that. Uh, so there's some references here that I'll leave with you. Um, I wanted to explain the algorithm. And you can kind of see, you start with these nine points in this case. It's a length 15 filter. This is the first iteration. So you just sort of uniformly pick some frequencies and you make a filter that has this alternation property. Well, the error, it, it go, the error goes bigger outside of it. So the idea is you move this frequency over a little bit towards the direction of maximum error. And you do that for all these stars moving them in the direction of maximum error. And so in the second iteration, you make an, a filter and it's got a bigger delta, but it's still outside that region in places. And then the next iteration, it looks like it's converged, but it hasn't quite, it's not quite there yet. And wait for it, there it is. So this filter, because the, fil the uh, error um, alternates and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, we know it's optimal. It has to be. It's, this is an optimal Minimax filter. And I'm out of time. I'm, may I have a few more minutes to just finish it out? So <laughs> we merged this uh, package, translated it from the Fortran. Well, OK. It, it was a Fortran program. It ended up as a C program. And then it was in SciPy. Um, and so uh, we added it, we translated it line for line. It's very very similar to the um, original C code. And it, it's by myself and thanks to Martin Holters for his contributions and reviews. So um, to call it, you just say using DSP and you, this is the name of the function, Remez, look for the help online, email me, whatever. Um, oh, I did a comparison with the C. So the C code is faster. Um, it's like 10 times as fast, but for dinky filters that no one ever designed. For reasonable filters of like 100 and more, Julia is within a factor of two. Huh, I found that interesting. I don't know why Julia's slow and this much slower for those lowers, don't care too much. It, it's fine for any reasonable order filter. At, at high order filters, it, it actually converges. Um, so in conclusion, go forth and design filters with Ramez in DSP. Unfortunately, there's no time for questions, so if we could all thank the speaker again. Oh, then... come on. One? Right, okay, we'll give him one after. quick question. application. Right. You know, actually, re recommended filter lengths can be quite short these days with FPGAs, and the delay through the filter is, um, is, is half the number of taps. So it depends on the application. There might be, uh, if delay doesn't matter, you can use a very long filter, um, and if computation doesn't matter, that's it, another thing. But uh, yeah, applying the filter is n, you know, O of n, n taps per output sample. So that, that's a factor. Maybe you would analyze if there was any uh, particular reason for why at the small sizes the yield was so much lower? No. Okay. Interesting. I, I think it's interesting. I have no idea why. Okay. Well, we should find out. That would be fun. Okay. Yeah, thanks. If we could all thank the speaker again.